Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Um, and welcome to session EI3, um, Leveraging Mainstream Benefits for Veteran Clients. Um, we're excited to have you. We're excited that everyone could be joining us um, on our fourth day of our two-week conference. Um, I'm Cindy Borden. I'm Director of Training and TA, and I just have one or two announcements before I hand it over to Anthony, who is our moderator for this session. You may have noticed, and you probably know if you've been on the last the sessions of the last few days, that you are entering this room um, muted, so you won't be able to talk through the phone. But we do want to hear your questions, and we will have time at the end of the, the session for your questions. So please go ahead and submit those through the question box in GoToWebinar. And also, just a reminder that at the end of the session, when the webinar ends, there will be a survey that pops up from GoToWebinar. If you could take just a couple minutes to click through that, um, it's, it, it shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes. That would be really helpful for us as we um, you know, assess and try to improve what we're offering to everyone. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Anthony. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Cindy. Can, can you hear me OK? Yes, I can. Perfect. OK, great. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, as Cindy indicated, my name is Anthony Love. Uh, I am the Senior Advisor and Director of Community Engagement for the Department of Veterans Affairs Homeless Program Office. And I'm so glad that you were able to join us today uh, where uh, this particular session will uh, be concerned with uh, discussing how to leverage our leveraging mainstream benefits for, uh, for our veterans, uh, those veteran clients that you may have. Uh, I am your moderator. And so um, I will uh, speak moderately, if you will. Uh, and, and, and let the experts um, who are on this panel really talk about those benefits and those resources that go beyond those veteran-specific resources. Uh, many times uh, as providers, we, we fully understand on how to get those benefits that those veterans have earned from the VA. And one of the things that um, we, we may sometimes uh, grapple with in terms of understanding uh, what other benefits are available, um, we, we, we don't necessarily realize that veterans are citizens first, and they also qualify for those benefits that can also help to expedite either their exit out of homelessness or to stabilize them while they're in housing uh, to, to, uh, to get access to those benefits. Uh, so this particular session uh, will uh, talk about uh, some of those resources that are available uh, through other anti-poverty programs and, and really talk about how to connect those veterans to them. Uh, programs like the Supplemental Nutrition, Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, uh, as well as the Temporary Assistance uh, Needs, um, uh, Temporary Assistance uh, Needs for Families, I, I'm probably messing that up, uh, are TANF. Uh, and our panelists um, who are with us today uh, we'll go through um, uh, giving you a little background on those programs and also talk about how to access those programs. Our first speaker will be Alex Ashbrook. And uh, Alex is the Director of uh, Special Projects and Initiatives um, for the Food Research and Action Center, or FRAC. And our second presenter uh, is Elizabeth Laura Bash, uh, who is the Director of Income and Work Supports uh, for uh, CLASP. Uh, so if um, folks are ready, I will definitely turn it over to Alex uh, to get us started. Great. Well, thank you so much, Anthony. And I am delighted to be here today. I wish I could see all your faces. Um, unfortunately, we'll have to wait a little while for that. But um, thank you for attending the session. And um, I hope you can take away some tools and resources to help the um, individuals and families you serve access nutrition. Next slide, please. So I'd be remiss if I didn't frame my remarks about the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, without acknowledging the tremendous hunger crisis our nation is experiencing in the wake of COVID-19 and its dual threats to the health, to health and the economy. Um, first, even before the pan pandemic, as many of you well know, we saw too many households, millions of households struggling with food insecurity. 
And the problem is so widespread that the um, Veterans Health Administration has been screening people for food insecurity, um, veterans who use their services for food insecurity for the past three years, I believe. And they've screened millions of veterans and I'm um, seeing far too many veterans struggling with food insecurity. Um, but what we're seeing now um, in, in COVID-19 times is both unprecedented in terms of numbers and also in terms of the depth of the struggles. I just wanted to share a few um, stats to put this in context. And it's really important to note that these stats represent real people who are struggling. Um, between 26 and 29 million adults living in the United States reported that members of their household sometimes or often did not have enough to eat during the first few months of COVID-19. And that's what we call hunger, basically. It's a, it's a, a, a lack of, of food. Um, food insecurity is a little broader, um, but 26 to 29 million adults um, Household, adults living in households reported that their members of their households didn't have enough to eat. And unfortunately, that, that is happening in every state. Um, 38 states in the District of Columbia report that more than one in 10 adults with children said they do not have enough to eat. And we're also seeing um, this hunger disproportionately hit Black, Latinx, and Native American households. Um, it's building on prior disproportionate harms, uh, numbers of people who were in food insecure households and the gaps are even getting wider. More than one in five black or Latinx adults with children reported that someone in their household often or didn't, uh, sometimes or often did not have enough food to eat. And, and that's double um, that of white and Asian households. Next slide, please. So these numbers, while shocking and shameful, probably aren't surprising to you all, given the work you do. Um, and we've also seen images of people waiting in lines at food banks all over the country to get food um, because they're struggles, struggling so much. And many of these people have never been to a food bank before. Uh, next slide, please. So what are some of the responses to address food insecurity? And while my remarks are going to um, mostly focus on this on SNAP, I wanted to acknowledge that programs um, like the ones Elizabeth's going to talk about um, also help to address food insecurity by giving families more money, freeing up more money and resources to cover basic needs. Uh, and that ultimately, if we're going to address hunger, um, the nutrition programs, as wonderful as they are, can't do it alone. We need to also address poverty and its root causes. Um, so we need to look at opportunities to create jobs with fair wages and make childcare more affordable. We need to invest in safe and affordable housing. And of course, we need to address the structural racism that creates disproportionate rates of hunger. So on to SNAP. So SNAP um, may be called something differently in your state. Um, for instance, uh, in California, it's called CalFresh. In Vermont, it's called Three Squares. But whatever the name, uh, the program is a federal program. And it's widely considered our nation's first line of defense against hunger for many reasons. One important reason is, is the reach of the program. Um, in March of 2020, there were 30, three, 37 million um, people in SNAP, and these are preliminary figures. As you can imagine, with job loss um, and closure of um, businesses, more people qualified for SNAP. And in April, 43 million people um, were benefiting from the program. So we've seen huge increases um, because of the need, and we expect to see more people um, applying for SNAP if the um, weekly um, unemployment benefits um, don't get continued. 
In terms of um, how many veterans participate in SNAP, the most recent data I could dig up was that there are about 1.2 million veterans on average each month receiving SNAP. And the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities has a, a great piece on that, including numbers um, in each state. Um, of course, this data is a little stale now because of the pandemic. Um, and I dare say that the numbers of veterans who are applying and benefiting from SNAP has increased. So what else is important to know about SNAP? Well, SNAP is an entitlement program, um, which basically means that if you're eligible for the program, you can get into the program. There's no cap. There's no line you have to wait to get into SNAP. Um, so it's available in every every corner of the country for eligible participants. And, and being an entitlement unique program is pretty unique these days. Another thing about SNAP is that people can shop where they want. Tens of thousands of retailers all over the country, be it supermarkets, corner store, farmer's markets, accept SNAP. So people can go using you know, the main lines of commerce to redeem their SNAP benefits, which are loaded into an EBT card that works like a debit card. Um, back in the day, SNAP used to be um, run with, with paper money, basically coupons. So you would bring the coupon out and pay the cashier. Now it's on a, an EBT card, making it easier to shop without stigma. Although, you know, there, there are still cases, there, are, there is still some stigma attached to the program. Next slide, please. So in addition to some of the features I just mentioned, SNAP has other strengths, and it won't surprise you to know that SNAP reduces hunger. Uh, there are also reams and reams of research on how SNAP not only reduces hunger, but it also lifts people out of poverty, it helps children develop, it improves health, and it even can um, support higher educational atta uh, attainment. SNAP is not, not only important to the people who are using it, but it's also important to the economy. For every dollar someone spends in a SNAP benefit, it generates about a dollar and 79 cents in local economic activity. So you can see that when people go and use money at a supermarket, that helps create jobs for people in the um, food industry, for farmers, and it also um, frees up money for the consumer. So the consumer may have money you know, now to buy food and they have, they'll use other money to buy um, taxable items in a grocery store like toilet paper or cleaning supplies. Um, and the SNAP benefits can only be used for food. Unfortunately, we're not only dealing with COVID-19 right now, we're also dealing with um, disasters, um, including the, the fires that have hit um, the West Coast and other areas of the country and Hurricane Sally that's hitting um, Florida and Alabama. Uh, so one of the things that is an offshoot of the SNAP program is something called Disaster SNAP. And that's a very important mechanism to help people who are struggling in times of disaster, who are, who are on SNAP and may um, lose access to electricity, so their food will spoil, so they can get replacement SNAP benefits, or um, new people who, are, who, who need to apply quickly um, for SNAP because of the disaster. So in many ways, SNAP is what I like to call a miracle of public policy. Um, because of all these strengths, because of all the help it provides, because of all the ripple effects it has in terms of positive outcomes. But I'd be remiss if I didn't just mention that there are some, some ways we can work to improve the SNAP program. And probably the most important way is to make the benefit more adequate. Um, right now, uh, the average uh, monthly benefit for a person is 125 um, dollars a month and benefits are, are um, based on something called the thrifty food plan, which is really an outdated model of how much money it takes for someone to have nutritious food across the month. 
Um, you probably hear some of your clients uh, talk about how SNAP just didn't last throughout the month, how the benefit didn't go far enough. So um, FRAC and partners continue to try and increase um, the level of SNAP benefits to make this program even, even better. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you um, apply for SNAP. And this is prior, these rules are prior to COVID-19. And then I'll um, give a shout out to some of the changes that have happened during COVID-19. Okay, so basically um, SNAP has some basic requirements uh, when applying. So when I work with um, someone to see if they're, they're eligible for SNAP, I first ask them what their, their gross income is, um, if they have any countable resources, um, whether they're a U.S. citizen. And if they're not a U.S. citizen, I have to find out if they're a type of, and I'm putting this in quotes, qualified alien, that's the term they use in the SNAP statute, um, to see if, if, if they're eligible. So basically, if you're um, a lawful permanent resident, a refugee, uh, or an asylee, um, LPRs have to be here for five years, but you, you may be eligible for, for SNAP, and, and um, kids do not have a five-year waiting period if they're LPRs. Okay, so after I've gone through those questions, I'll, I'll dig a little bit more into someone's um, income. Um, because I need to see if they meet the gross income threshold. So basically, um, I have to find out how many people are in the SNAP household. And this is a different definition of household than what you would use for applying taxes or um, for filing taxes or some other programs. It basically asks who purchases and prepares meals in your household. So you don't necessarily have to be related to be a SNAP household. Um, you just have to cook and purchase meals together. So when you're looking at income and resources, you're looking at what it is for the entire household. Um, and your gross income has to be at, at or below 130% of the federal poverty level. And just to get you a sense of what that is, um, for a household, for one person, it's about um, $13,000. And for uh, three people, it's, I'm trying to, it's, I'm trying to think fine where I wrote this down. It's about 20, $22,000 um, for a family of three or a household of three. Um, and you can see that's very low. Um, as a result, there's a federal policy that many, many states have adopted, which whereby they can increase the gross um, income threshold to see if someone's eligible. And they can increase it up to 200% of the federal poverty level. And many states have taken advantage of this federal option. Um, it's a really important policy to help people who have earnings, who are working, but they have um, expenses. So in order to qualify for SNAP, you not only have to have a gross income of a certain amount, you have to, through deductions, meet a net income of 100% of the federal poverty level. So if you have high housing, high childcare, dependent care expenses, you can, you can um, if you, you get a work deduction, you can make that 100% threshold. So the policy that raises the gross um, income test has been under attack. It's, it's still available and we're fighting really hard to make sure it isn't rescinded because many families and veterans would lose access to SNAP benefits if that policy were terminated. Likewise, you have to make sure you have um, assets below a certain amount. And again, some, some states have adopted this policy where they can eliminate assets or raise the asset test um, with, with the acknowledgement that one, first of all, most people who are applying for SNAP don't have huge number, huge amounts of assets, um, but and, and that it saves the state time from asking a zillion questions about whether you have um, a you know, bond account, whether you have property inside the US or outside the US. 
Instead, by eliminating the asset test, it streamlines the program, and it's still very targeted to people who are, are most in need. So once you meet those thresholds, um, then you complete an application. And um, in most states, you can submit your application online, or you can go to your state agency, or you can actually mail it in. But you know, word word to the wise: make sure you copy anything um, you mail in. Um, the state is supposed to pro send you a notice telling you not whether you're eligible for SNAP benefits within 30 days, and after you submit the application, you'll need to typically complete an interview, an eligibility interview, and then give proof to verify the information um, you provide. So verification that um, of your earnings, of who lives in your household, um, of housing expenses, etc. So if you're found eligible, a really important thing to note is that you will receive benefits retroactive to the date you submitted your application. So um, it's important to get the application in as soon as possible, even if um, you don't have everything, um, every attachment available, because you can, you can follow up within that 30-day window um, with those verifications. Um, there's also a provision to give people emergency SNAP um, within seven days of the application date, and those basically are for people who, who are in, in desperate need of assistance because they only have less than $100 in liquid resources and less than $150 in monthly gross income, um, and many, many um, individuals who are homeless may meet that criteria. Okay, um, next slide, please. Let's see, keep going. I think the slide, COVID-19 snap rules. Okay, yeah, that's it, thanks. Okay, so the good news is there are some changes that are helping um, people access SNAP during COVID-19. Um, They've been adjusting interview requirements, so you don't have to go in and do a face-to-face -face in, uh, interview, and um, they're also, in some instances, delaying the need for an interview, you know, pushing it down um, the line, not only to help people, but also the state agencies that are getting inundated with more SNAP applications. Um, in some states, uh, they're extending certification periods. Um, but typically, homeless um, individuals, people who are struggling with homelessness, have to recertify every six months. Um, they're ending reporting requirements, um, which basically are when you have to give the agency notice about any changes in circumstance. And they're also um, allowing um, new states to participate in online purchase pilots, which Maybe hearing about in the news. Obviously, with COVID-19, we're all doing everything possible not to expose ourselves. And going grocery shopping, you know, is something that makes people very nervous, or some people very nervous. So they're allowing um, states to operate SNAP programs online. Um, however, the reach is very minimal at this point because only a few retailers are allowed in the program, and people, you know, don't necessarily have cash on their card to take full advantage of online shopping. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the, the most important um, change in SNAP um, during COVID-19 has been um, increasing the benefit level for people. So you remember I, I said that you get a benefit based on you know, your net income. Um, so a household of one could be eligible for a benefit between $16 and $194 a month. During COVID-19, every person, every household gets the maximum benefit for that household size, which is $194 for a household of one, $355 for a household of two, 
and $509 for a household of three. So if you're working with um, people who are receiving SNAP, you should make sure that they're getting the maximum for the, their household size. Um, that policy is still in play um, and it, it's supposed to terminate when the public health crisis terminates. Um, so that's been a helpful policy, but I'll talk about why it's been inadequate because there were there forty percent of all SNAP households were already getting the maximum SNAP benefit for their household size. Um, so they are the poorest households typically, and they're being um, affected by COVID nineteen and rising food prices, and they're not getting any assistance, um, additional assistance from from the federal government. Um, there, there's hope that maybe they'll they'll get more assistance. There was a case in Pennsylvania that contended the agency, the USDA, had misinterpreted what Congress had act, asked them to do with this relief um, legislation, Families First. So in Pennsylvania, um, they're they're working to get people every every household more SNAP benefits. But but stay tuned to see if how things transpire. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so those of you who um, work helping people apply for a SNAP probably recognize um, some of these barriers to SNAP participation. Um, I, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how to address some of the barriers, but the ones that sort of resonate um, with me at least when I've done work with homeless people or veterans are um, lack of computer access that can pose um, problems in readily applying for SNAP, um, help navigating the process um, because of some of the um, barriers that homeless people face. Um, and then, of course, stigma. Um, particularly, I've heard um, veterans and, and military families talk about how they're, they're embarrassed to have to ask for help when, they're, when they've served their country. And then there's also just a lack of um, information about eligibility. Um, you know, states have adopted rules that are helping more people apply that may not have been um, true when someone was looking to apply for SNAP, um, you know, years ago. So sometimes the eligibility um, guidelines have increased um, and people can apply. All right, next slide, please. So in order to address some of these barriers, I wanted to make sure you had on hand just a few of the key policy provisions that can help um, homeless um, uh, individuals or people who are residing in shelters access um, SNAP. So one thing is um, people may not be clear that you, you don't need a permanent address to apply for SNAP. Um, you can get SNAP benefits even if you are living on the streets and don't have a mailing address. Uh, if you live on the shelter, in, in a shelter, you can actually bring a letter from the shelter employee that says you live there when you apply, and that will help verify your, your address. Because for SNAP, you have to be in, in the local jurisdiction for SNAP. So they do need some kind of verification that you indeed live in the catchment area. Um, some people may be wondering if you can get SNAP if you live in a shelter that has um, free meals served. Yes, you can get SNAP even if, if your shelter or your housing provides you with free meals. Uh, a common um, problem for um, some homeless people is that they may not have a photo ID or they may not be able to access their photo ID. It may be in you know, the, a storage in a locker. Um, you do need some proof of identity to apply for SNAP. But um, a photo ID is only one of the many ways you can prove identity. Um, and you cannot be turned down for SNAP if you don't have a photo ID. So it's important to know like how you can make sure your state eligibility worker knows that in lieu of a photo ID, you may be able to use something like a work or a school badge or a health benefits card, or an ID from another um, social service agency, um, even a pay stub or a birth certificate, or even a voter registration card. 
And then the um, the SNAP uh, employee can the SNAP worker can even check your ID by calling the shelter um, or your employer to ask them to verify you are who you say you are. Another thing that's very helpful um, to increase someone's SNAP benefit are eligible deductions. And recently. Uh, a standard homeless deduction was added as an as an deduction across a deduction across the board. Before it was only available for states that elected to use it, but now every state should be giving people the standard homeless deduction. And like taxes, the more deductions you have from the gross income, the higher your net the lower your net income and the higher your SNAP benefit. One thing we hear a lot is that um, homeless people are not able to, um, they have issues with cooking and storing their food. Um, so there's some states that allow um, for SNAP to be redeemed at certain restaurants um, for homeless people or for um, older um, adults, um, 60 plus. Um, and you'll, you'd get a special card to buy meals at restaurants. Unfortunately, that program is not widespread but it's something to look at to advocate for, and it's been made a little easier um, during COVID-19. Next slide, please. All right, um, so I wanted to just mention that there are lots of organizations um, around the country that are helping people um, apply for SNAP. Um, on our FRAC website, we have state partners, um, and many of those state partners are enrollment assisters for SNAP. Um, people can overcome some of the obstacles I mentioned by working with these groups, and of course, um, getting the information from trusted messengers. So whether you have capacity to actually help people apply for SNAP is one thing, but you definitely um, can be a vehicle of sending out information and giving them, uh, giving um, your constituents messaging on how important the program is and how helpful it is and trying to reduce um, the stigma. We're also working with um, other anti-hunger, anti-poverty groups to make the SNAP program better and better and make it more seamless for people to apply. Hopefully technology is gonna take us in that direction. And we're also working to um, continue to um, build out the waivers that have been used during COVID-19 to extend them, to make them nationwide. And then hopefully, um, if, if I can even say there's any bright lining from this COVID-19 crisis, but I, I do hope that some of these things will, will usher in improvements um, for people um, experiencing food insecurity by helping them more readily connect to SNAP. Just one next slide, please. Um, I wanted to conclude with a plug for um, what what we need to do to um, ramp up our nation's um, response to food insecurity, the alarming rates of food insecurity at the national level, and that is to really focus on boosting SNAP. Um, boosting SNAP maximum benefits by 15%, um, increasing the monthly benefit. I mean, you, you can imagine how um, in need people are if they, if they go through all the paperwork to get $16 a month. Um, we, want, we want that to be at least $30 a month. And then we wanna um, make sure that some of these harmful rules um, that um, have been, um, proposed, in some cases um, passed, are not implemented. The, the rules have are not in place right now, like the three month time limit, but we wanna make sure those are, are um, taken out until the economy recovers and beyond. Next slide, please. So thanks again. I look forward to hearing um, questions, answering them, I hope. And um, just wanted to let you know that FRAC is here for you right now, but we'd love to, um, you know, connect after the session or beyond. If you have any questions, if you have any um, need for information or advocacy ideas, so thanks so much. All right.
Thank you, uh, Alex. And now we'll turn it over to uh, Elizabeth Laura Bash uh, with the Center for Law and Social Policy. Hi, thank you so much for having me. CLASP is a multi-issue anti-poverty organization. And so um, Alex gave us all a deep dive into one very important program, SNAP. And I'm gonna do a much quicker take on a whole bunch of programs that uh, might be uh, available to your clients or maybe they've heard of and think they're eligible, but it turns out they're not. And so just helping them understand what the rules are can be super helpful. So I'm going to start with non-VA medical benefits, if I can get the next slide. So I know m many veterans are eligible for health care through the Veterans Administration, but some are not, possibly because of when they served or the circumstances under which they were discharged. So our core safety net health care programs, Medicaid or CHIP, are available to most pregnant women and children with low incomes. And among those are eligible, there is already pretty high participation because healthcare providers will enroll people um, when they come in seeking help. In states that have expanded Medicaid, um, it is also available to most people who have incomes under 133% of poverty. ACA subsidies, the Affordable Care Act subsidies, are available for people with incomes between 100% and 400% of the poverty line. But if you look at the next chart, or next slide, you'll see that in the states that haven't expanded Medicaid, um, there is a coverage gap where childless adults are often just not eligible all, at all and parents lose eligibility at quite low income levels and that they don't qualify for the marketplace subsidies until their income hits 100% uh, of the poverty line, which is a little over 12,000 for a single person. Next slide, please. Uh, this map shows the current status of state Medicaid expansion that it has been adopted by 39 states, including DC. Of those, um, three of them have not yet implemented. Um, I think is what, whoops, it, that's how I have it. I'm not quite sure of the coloring that's showing up there. But as you'll see, um, it's definitely become an extremely concentrated geography where it really is largely the South, um, particularly the Southeast, um, and a few upper Midwestern states that have not expanded. Um, that's a real challenge for folks who might be in the coverage gap and um, something to be mindful of. Next slide, please. A few exceptions or special cases to be aware of. Uh, young adults, um, plans that cover children under their parents' plans have to provide coverage until the adult child reaches 26. So in some cases, veterans may in fact still be eligible for coverage under their parents' plans. Um, youth who were in foster care are sort of in a parallel provision. States are required to cover them under Medicaid until they turn 26, even in a state that hasn't expanded Medicaid. So that's something that people are not always aware of. Flagging immigrants are fairly complicated roles for Medicaid as well as for SNAP. Uh, Alex talked about some of the roles. One thing to note is that veterans and their spouses are actually one of the groups that's exempt from the five-year waiting period. Um, another thing to pay attention to is that many immigrants who are ineligible to Medicaid due to their immigration status, but lawfully present, can get ACA subsidies even if they have incomes under 100% of poverty. So that's a special role. I'm not going to get into the whole public charge rule because I can do a whole hour presentation just on it. But one thing to flag is that there's some weird complexity here that benefits, public benefits such as SNAP or Medicaid that are received by active duty military members and their spouses are not considered under public charge. Unfortunately, benefits received by veterans 
don't get that special treatment. So um, something to just be aware of in the cases where veterans might be seeking help under these programs. Uh, next slide. Moving on to the refundable tax credits. The big one is the earned income tax credit. Um, this is a quite significant benefit for parents who have at least one dependent children who they claim on their tax return. Um, my guess, and you should tell me if I'm wrong, is that most homeless veterans are not residing with their children if they have them, and so they'd only be eligible for the EITC for workers without dependent children. That's a pretty small benefit. It's $529 maximum. It just barely offsets um, a little more than the income tax that a worker at the poverty line would have to pay. It does not offset the full the payroll taxes. Um, but still, particularly if um, someone might have had wages withheld for taxes while they were working, um, they should and they have to file to get that money back, they should definitely also file for the EITC. Uh, next slide, please. This is um, something that's really, really timely right now. Um, as you probably all know, under the CARES Act, stimulus payments were available to almost all in people up to uh, 75,000 in household income for singles, 150,000 for married couples. And it's worth $1,200 per qualifying adult and $500 per dependent child under 17. Um, that's a significant amount of money. And as I'll show you on the next slide, there's still a fair number of people who have not yet received this benefit. Um, I will flag there are some exceptions to who can get it, particularly based on immigration status. Um, and also if you're claimed as a dependent by someone else, you're not eligible. So most people in the United States got these payments automatically. If you filed a tax return in either 2019 or 2018, they'll have sent it to you automatically, either by direct deposit if they had that bank information, and if not, in an envelope to the last known mailing address. Similarly, anyone who got Social Security, SSI, Railroad Retirement, or Veterans Affairs Pension or Disability Benefits will have gotten it automatically. For this second population, it's worth noting that those payments only included the adult portion, not the child dependents, unless the recipient filled out the form online to get the $500 per child as well. The IRS estimates that about 12 million people are not reached automatically by either of these paths. About 7 million of them have requested the stimulus payment, but that leaves 5 million people who are still eligible. And if they wanna get that stimulus payment this year, they have to apply by October 15th. So that's less than a month away to receive the payment this year. So if there's one thing you take away from what I'm saying today, it's that if you're not already doing outreach to your clients on these stimulus payments, you should be making a note in your phone right now to get involved. How to do that. Next slide, please. There is a pretty organized effort to um, do outreach. And hmm, so I have the URL for this. Um, attached to the slide, it seems to have gotten lost somewhere in translation. But if you go to, if you can Google uh, CBPP, that's the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, Stimulus Outreach, they have a whole toolkit with social media graphics like this, sample flyers, all sorts of ways that you can conduct outreach. And definitely, if you're working with homeless veterans in the next month, every person you talk to, you should ask, have you gotten your stimulus payment? Can we help you get it? If not, so how can people get it? Next slide, please. The IRS has a website that people can go to and Again, 
something in PowerPoint ain't the URL, but if you Google IRS stimulus payments, you will get to this page. And you can see there's two options. If you think they already know about you, that you filed your taxes and you wanna know, hey, what happened to my check? You can do get my payment. You can find out where it is, find out if they've direct deposited it or mailed it. If you did not file a return, um, and you want to get it, you can enter here. It's a fairly short form. I will flag that it has to be done online. There is no paper form to use. So um, again, this is a way that you may be able to really help your clients walking around literally with like hotspots and laptops. Um, people can do it on phones. When it started, it was a little nasty on mobile devices. They did improve it as the year went on. Um, probably still easier on a laptop if you can support that. Next slide, please. One thing to file a flag is that that form is just to get the stimulus payments. It does not get you EITC for previous years. It doesn't get you a tax refund if you're owed because you had an employer who withheld wages um, because they thought you were going to owe taxes. Um, I think this is a real capacity question. The sort of easy thing that gets people help right away is just fill that form, um, get people their stimulus payments. If people have the information, if they say, oh yeah, I worked for part of the year and then I lost my job. And so, you know, yeah, I think my employer was taking taxes out of my paycheck. Like it really might be helpful to help them actually file a return and figure it out and get the EITC and get refunds. And in fact, you can go back multiple years and file multiple years tax returns and claim the EITC. So that is something worth considering. But again, clock is ticking next four weeks, um, really pushing, helping people get these refunds. Next slide. Okay, I'm now gonna talk super briefly about two more programs and I know I've gone really, really fast and I'm happy to answer questions either today or my contact information is at the end and I'm happy to go into more depth on any of these. Pandemic Unemployment Assistance is the new federally funded unemployment assistance program that was created um, to respond to COVID-19. The thing to note about this is that it covers a lot of workers who are not eligible for unemployment insurance under the regular program. Uh, maybe because they didn't work enough to qualify for UI. Um, increasingly in states, if you work very part-time, you will not qualify for unemployment insurance benefits. Um, and also increasingly, a lot of people are paid as Contractors are considered self-employed. So um, Uber drivers are sort of everyone's example. Instacart workers, they're often reported as self-employed. They get paid with a 1099 MISC, not a W-2. Um, those folks wouldn't ordinarily be eligible for unemployment insurance. They are eligible for pandemic employment assistance. Um, so again, talking to people. Did you work for part of the year? Did you lose your job because of COVID? Are you unable to look for work because of COVID? That might qualify people. And um, people might not know to apply because they're used to, oh, I tried to apply for UI a couple of years ago and I was rejected. Well, this has different roles, so it's worth flagging. Finally, last slide, please. TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. And this is a really sad slide because what this slide shows is for every 100 poor families with children in each state, how many got TANF cash assistance? And what you see is in only, you know, five states, it looks like, did more than 40, um, families for every hundred poor families with children get cash assistance. And a lot of the country, it's 10% less, 10 to 20%. It's really um, a pretty skimpy safety net with lots of holes in it. But if you do have clients who have dependent children, it can provide cash assistance. And as 
Alex said, SNAP is, you know, an amazing program, but it's for food. You can't use SNAP to buy diapers. You can't use SNAP to buy bus passes. Um, so there's lots of things where people do need cash. And TANF is not just in the um, this current crisis, um, you know, because the stimulus payments, the pandemic unemployment assistance, those are just for this crisis. But TANF is a program that exists all the time. So it's only for families with children. It's easier to get in some states than others, but it is something that's worth keeping on your list of possibilities for the clients who it might work for. And I think the next slide just has my contact information with more questions. Any in case people have follow-up questions, but why don't I hand it back to the moderator and we can spend a little time on Q&A. All right. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, we do have a little time for questions and I uh, did receive uh, some questions um, in, in the chat box. Uh, so this question, uh, I'm combining questions and it would be for both of you. Uh, does income from VA pension or service connection count for SNAP eligibility? And that same question also uh, regarding SSI or SSDI benefits. So who would like to go first? <laughs> Elizabeth, you want to go first? Yeah, so SSI, I do believe it's counted, though I'd want to double check it. And DI is not based on your current income, but is based on your earnings history. So that's the difference between SSI and DI. Um, SSDI is uh, um, social insurance is the technical term that people use. It's based, you have to have worked in the past in order to qualify for it, whereas SSI is means tested and if you don't have the work up history to qualify for DI. And some people can get both. And yes, veterans benefits are counted for SNAP purposes. All right. Uh, Next question, if uh, someone is literally homeless um, on the street, not in shelter, doesn't have an address, um, how can they go about proving they are in the jurisdiction uh, to apply for SNAP? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you have to work with your state agency, but they should be able to, I mean, even draw a map of where they're sleeping in the street. Um, that should suffice or get um, someone to to um, send a note like I know this person lives here. Okay. All right. Um, next question is kind of a two parter. Um, one, um, someone would like to um, have you explain more about the homeless deduction. And then the question is, would a veteran in HUD VASH, which is the voucher permanent housing program, qualify for the standard homeless uh, deduction? That's a great question. Um, the homeless deduction just is a set deduction that anyone who is characterized as homeless um, for SNAP purposes automatically receives. And again, it's like the tax if you file your taxes, the more deductions you get, the higher um, your SNAP benefit's gonna be. So it's $176 off your income. Um, I, I, I'd have to look as to the person who, what's the, what's the housing called? Uh, it's, it's called the HUD-VASH program. It's a uh, permanent supportive housing program uh, between VA and HUD where uh, for the most part, a, a homeless veteran or chronically homeless is the target, but a homeless veteran uh, would receive a voucher uh, from their local public housing authority, which is funded by HUD, and receive supportive services from VA. Okay. I'm 90% sure then the person wouldn't qualify as, in, to meet the definition of ho homeless since they're housed. It's like a um, Section 8 type voucher, but... Um, if, if that person wants to type in there, uh, contact me via email, I can verify it. And Elizabeth may know um, the answer to this question as well. <laughs> but it's a good question to look up. So I will take a look at it and um, love to get back to you. 
Okay. All right. Uh, this question is for um, Elizabeth. Uh, it's, it's kind of a two-parter. It's uh, what is the five-year waiting period for health care and how uh, can we help clients apply for that payment? Sure. So um, since 1996, there has been a five-year waiting period for most immigrants to access Medicaid, SNAP, cash assistance, um, and this is lawfully present immigrants. Um, people are really confused by that. Um, there are exceptions. Children can get SNAP benefits right away without a waiting period, um, and states can choose to cover pregnant women and children without a waiting period under Medicaid, so that is a state option. Um, but as I said, there are exceptions, and veterans do um, qualify for those exemptions. And I think people are often surprised at how many um, non-citizens serve in the U.S. military. So it is actually a significant population. So in terms of applying for Medicaid, um, each state will have its own website. You can actually go through, um, in some states, through healthcare.gov at any time, and it will connect people to Medicaid. But if they're um, it's probably simpler to go straight to the state website. And it's often the same agency that handles both SNAP and Medicaid eligibility and will determine eligibility for both at the same time. All right, thank you. And, and for folks, for the audience, I know some of the, uh, previously when Elizabeth was uh, presenting, uh, she mentioned some uh, sites and those links are in the chat box uh, for those that, that want that information. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, uh, the question is, how do you apply for PUA? So that's for your state unemployment agency. Um, so it's going to vary by state. And that has been pretty messy in a lot of states. In some states, they require people to apply for the regular UI program and get rejected. And then they can apply for the PUA. Um, so it is going to be a state by state process. But um, there's a lot of people doing it right now. So if you Google your state name and PUA, it should come right up. All right. And I think we can squeeze in one more question. Uh, the question is, why are the numbers for TANF recipients so low? <laughs> That's a great question. I'm laughing because I've spent much of my career working on that. Um, it's not funny, um, but it is a great question. It's um, Alex talked about how SNAP is an entitlement and that everyone who qualifies is, is guaranteed to get it. TANF is not an entitlement, it is a block grant and states can do lots of things with the funds in addition to cash assistance and states can set the rules and many states have just made it extremely difficult for anyone to access cash assistance. Um, and I do apologize for laughing, it really isn't funny, it's just no, completely, completely get it, completely understand. So I think that's all of the questions. I uh, want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I thank the, the panelists for the informative information. I think that your contact information is out there uh, for folks who have additional questions. Um, and so, Cindy, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, that's it. Thank you so much, Anthony and Elizabeth and Alex. We really appreciate um, so much great information in this session. I wish we had more than an hour. Um, that's one of the things we've realized over time that, that we have way too much to pack into 60 minutes, but um, really great information. And I know I have a couple of takeaways um, from this session and I hope other folks do as well. So thank you all for for presenting and for those of you who are attending as soon as the webinar um, ends a little survey will pop up and we'd love for you to uh, fill that out so that we can make sure that we make all of these sessions worth your time and again anthony elizabeth alex thanks so much for your time we really appreciate it oh, thank you thank you so much for inviting us yes and um, do feel free to reach out with questions happy to help stay safe thanks and well so everyone yeah. You too.